Hello. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. We are Shades of Vengeance, and that is a very heavy reverb. It doesn't matter. Um, we are going to talk about the things we make, specifically audio dramas. Uh, my name is Leo. And I'm Ed. And uh, I'm going to sit down. Why are we here? That's, that's obviously the first question. We're, we're here because we think audio dramas are an unrepresented, underrepresented, you told me not to say under that. Represented. Underrepresented. medium. And um, they give you an opportunity to tell stories in a way that you can't through a novel, through a comic, through pretty much any other way of telling stories. They give you this different dimension to the way in which you approach the world. And that's the thing that interests us, uh, has done for, for many years. Um, we've been avid listeners of audio, fans for a long, long time. And uh, we have also quite, perhaps more importantly for us standing here and talking to you, we have produced a number of audio dramas. And one audiobook. And an audiobook, indeed, <laughs> indeed. So I've got some notes here, so I'm going to shamelessly refer to my notes as we go through, because otherwise I'm going to run over, because there's a lot to cover. But you're also going to have to forgive me, because we're going to have to run quite quickly through a number of topics. So if you have any further questions, like grab us at the end um, or come back to our stand, it's 1G11. Uh, we'd be happy to have a, have a chat about any of the things that we talk about or indeed let you listen to any of our audio dramas. We've got a handy dandy little Bluetooth speaker. So when you're starting a project, the first thing that you've got to do is figure out what it is that you're producing. And the method we use to do this is called the project paradigm. And what the project paradigm basically asks is, what is it about this project that interests you? What is it that you want to achieve? And we like to refine it down into a small number of words. A buzzword that you can, oh, a buzz sentence that you can always refer back to and also remind anyone you're working with to keep in the back of their head. So uh, a favorite of mine, even though it's not my personal one, is cowboys in space. Because that could mean lots of different things. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you can look at that and go, OK, what I want to achieve is cowboys in space. Now, that's quite vague. That's OK. It's OK to be vague. But what if you said instead, OK, it's, it's cowboys in space who are disgruntled about the current political state of the universe? Well, there you are. There's Firefly. Um, you know, that's what you're trying to achieve. That's what you're trying to bring out from that story. So when you think about your audio drama, have a think first about what it is that you want to say or tell with your story and sort of almost what success criteria are. Because if you don't deliver that thing, you will not be happy with the project in the end. Now, this is really, really helpful, especially when bringing on other team members, because it means that you can share a vision on how you're going, on what you're going to deliver. It's also for audio, a little later down the line, it's nice to remind your editors or your voice actors, this is the vision, this is the, the phrase that you need to refer back to as you're building the story. Now, we actually have an entire panel on the Project Paradigm, basically, which we're not doing this year. So, um, again, I have to move on quite quickly. And uh, what we're moving on to, again, shamelessly checking the notes, um, is about having a world for your audio drama to exist in. Well, of course. And you might think, OK, well, I'll just put it in a modern world. That's fine. But you want it to fit in a world that suits it. And that might mean that you want to build one. So we wanted to spend a couple of minutes just briefly giving you some pointers on how to build a world. So I've built quite a lot of worlds, uh, over a dozen so far. And I've explored them through role-playing games, comics, novels, card games, and obviously audio dramas. Um, there is actually a trick to it. And I sort of have a five point here is, you know, do these things and you're in a pretty good, pretty good place to start. So. First of all, start with feelings, not events. Don't talk about the elder god that's been sleeping for 5,000 years underground and is about to emerge. No, what actual effect does that have on the people around? So maybe they are m more irritable, more quick to end up in fights in the street as a result of this. Because that's the thing that people are going to perceive when they experience your world first. 
Now, the Elder God thing is great, and you can do that in a few minutes, but start with how do people feel? How do people react to the current situation? Secondly, and again, I'm running through these quite quickly. Apologies for that. The central conflict of the universe, what is it? What, what is the thing that makes this story worth telling? What's going to change as a result of this story being told? Figure out what that is. Obviously, it should fit in with your project paradigm. But make sure that you figure out what it is that's actually going to happen and change during this story. And make sure it's reasonably central to the universe or the world, at least, that you're creating. Thirdly, remember that every character is the hero of their own story. Um, that might not be the story that you're telling today. In fact, in most cases, it won't be, because only the main character really has their story being told. But every character is the hero of their own story. Now, that happens in the background. That happens that motivates them in a certain way and changes the way in which they react to the world. That's something that you want to make sure that you remember, you bring, again, bring back the feelings. So why is this character acting this way? Well, it's probably something to do with their own story. And motivations will change as different characters get a different spotlight, especially in an audio medium. That's why you can use an inner voice or more dialogue in certain places. It's a chance to expand without over-expanding. You don't need to show lots. Less is more in some cases. On the fourth, the fourth point sort of refers back to that one, um, which is that the, the main character of your story exists among other characters, of course. And for the most part, your main character is likely to be the one that moves the story forwards. Uh, Star Wars A New Hope is a good example. In general, Luke is moving the story forwards. However, near the beginning, he's like, no, Uncle Ben, Aunt May, they're dead. Spoilers. Um, they're dead, um, and I'm just panicking. I, I don't even know what to do. And it takes Obi-Wan to be there to actually move that story forward. So there are times when the main character, because this is the way human beings are, will stop, they'll freeze, they won't know what to do next, they'll get lost. And in those cases, the secondary characters, it's fine to have, have them be motivators. But watch out for what I would call the Hamlet factor, which is the extreme of the main character never does anything unless they are forced to by someone else in the story. That can be quite disconnecting for people from, from your main character. And finally, the, the, the fifth point for creating universes, um, there's a history. There's, there's things that you won't have explained. That's OK. You know, what, what happens off screen, what happens not during the audio drama or the story that you're telling is fine. You don't have to thrust every single detail down my throat. I don't need to know why Han Solo is a bit of a dick. You know, I, like, I, I can figure it out. Um, so think about that when you're deciding whether to explain a character's motivations or not. And think about, do they need to be explained, or are they really quite obvious to pretty much everyone? If you're not sure, ask someone else. Ask them their opinion. Uh, the thing is that nowadays tropes force people down a certain line. So people realize, you know, if you end up with a Han Solo type character, people are going to know and expect a certain thing. So are we going to So that's my five quick points on world building. And again, I apologize for the rush. We are somewhat time constrained. OK, so we're going to take a big leap. And I'm going to tell you about the uh, main difference between an audiobook and an audio drama. Um, it's writing down a little bit more extra stuff. Audiobooks mean that you have the narrator extrapolating on what's, exact, uh, what's there, reading it off the page, reading you a nice story and getting you into a world. When uh, you're making an audio drama, consider if you want to add extra effects. You're essentially writing a film with a blank screen. It doesn't matter how much or how little sound design you're using, you get to play a bit more in the writing stage, in the scripting stage, you can play a bit more with stage directions and what you want to be doing in the narrative because then you can work out how that might sound a little later. And it's not... Um, it's not a big deal if you say, oh yes, he's definitely running up 10 flights of stairs because you can figure out where that 
sound might go later on as you're building the, uh, the story itself. It's also worth bearing in mind that you can absolutely have an audio drama with a narrator. Uh, you know, I don't think Leo meant to imply otherwise. Um, you know, it's, it's fine to have a narrator. Again, taking the movie example, a lot of movies have narrators. And that's, that's fine. Um, it's a way of doing it. Think carefully about whether you want to. Personally, I like to do it without a narrator. I like to have the characters themselves tell the story. But that brings its own set of challenges. It means that your sound effects need to be on point. It means that sometimes your dialogue needs to be a little bit exposition-y because you're not going, OK, yeah, well, this is exactly what's going on. So yeah, I mean, it, it has swings and roundabouts. There are pros and cons to it. So talking about writing, um, the, next, the next step that we think is related to getting a script together. And I think that I can summarize what we're going to say by kind of saying, have a script, but don't have an immutable final script. Because if it can't ever be changed, you're actually closing a lot of doors that you will probably regret closing. When we were recording some of our audio dramas, we made changes from scene to scene because we had actors in the room and we were talking about uh, the speech pattern on the page wasn't being reflected in the takes, in the recording. And we started thinking about the value of a certain scene or if we needed to add extra detail. So it's, a script is a, it's not so much a guideline as it is a, it's a skeleton, right? It's a framework, yeah. It's something that you can build on and flesh out further if there's a thing that you see, oh, that would be really good to include, or, oh no, that character now talks with this accent because we decided that during casting, so now all of the dialogue kind of reads wrong, but the content's gonna be the same, but it'll be delivered differently. So, bear in mind that for an indie production, you know, talking about casting, you're, you're probably gonna need the director, the writer, um, the audio recordist, so they're probably going to have to wear hats of minor characters because there are probably going to be more characters than you have people. And at the end of the day, with the best one in the world, you probably won't have an expert voice actor who can sound different with 50 different voices. It's quite hard. He's I, quite I, good. I tried actually. 50 different voices and I fell flat at about number five, maybe. Oh, I think that's a bit harsh <laughs> to yourself, actually. I would have said it was more like 20 you got. Okay. Generous. Yeah. So... We're, we're going to kind of stop on writing and casting and everything here because we know that what you're kind of really here for is the voice work and the production bit. And you sat through the boring bit. So we're going to talk a little more about the voice work and the production now. Um, but if you, again, if you want to know more about writing, about world building, please come, come have a chat with us. We're more than happy to talk to you. Um, let's talk about giving a voice to your characters. So you've right. cast your character. You know, you know who you want to play them, but... Uh, you know, you want to sit down, you want to work with the actor to come up with something that really suits that character. Um, it's a two-way process. For the actors in the room, remember at the end of the day, the director's creative vision is the... Um, it's not the be-all and end-all, but it's going to not be as malleable as you might like it to be. So um, don't fight to do an accent just because it's easier <laughs> than another voice. And from the director's side, you know, going back to what we said about the script not being immutable, being really, really important, I think that comes into that two-way process that we're talking about as well. That being said, when I say, oh, the voices, the voices, I want to remind everybody in this room, your own voice is unique. You do not need to come up with different character voices to play characters. You need to discuss what that character is doing and see if you can tell that story. You don't have to worry about sounding 100% different or nailing this accent, especially if it's in a fictional world. If, it, if your character voice is set in a fictional universe, it doesn't matter where they're from as long as it sounds like them to you and your crew. It's, yeah, I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that we occasionally deliberately distorted an accent because we felt like, okay, these people have actually had a bit of a melange in terms of the way they've grown up and, and the accents they've grown up around. So, you know, if they say a few words a little bit differently, that's actually a thing we chose on a few occasions. Uh, when your characters are nomads in space, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. 
Um, we did want to talk about, um, if you do want to do an accent, you want to talk about beg, borrowing, and stealing. Okay, this is my wheelhouse. I am the king of both of those things, all of those things. So, if you're learning an accent, beg, borrowing, and stealing, um, follow the three S's. Songs, sentences, and swearing. Because if you can learn, uh, if you listen to folks that uh, know more languages, ask them what their favorite swear words are, because then you'll be able to feel how that sounds in your mouth. So for example, I'm not going to swear in Russian, but this is how I learned Russian, because they kept telling me what the actual, uh, the accents, the swear words have lots of verbs and hard syllables. So I kept remembering the rhythm, and then I focused on that rhythm until it became a little bit more natural. So, uh, songs is another one for that. The great thing about the English language is everybody sings in it. So, Eurovision songs, Irish folk, um, Welsh jazz. Yes, I did find that once. I still haven't nailed a Welsh accent. But um, I listen to that music and if you can kind of repeat the songs there, it's a way to, it's a way to learn. Um, and finally, 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 the International Dialects of English Archive. It's a website, um, it's called idea.org, or if you Google International Dialects of English, there's absolute hundreds of interviews, just plain old interviews of people reading the same linguist script, like different um, speech therapy par um, dialogue. And it's from all around, the, all around the globe for different dialects. So you can research that, you can send it to your actors, um, get We've people to listen to it. We've really used it very expense, uh, extensively, I can speak, in the past. I did try to learn Icelandic by doing that for a boot camp for two weeks. Hulda, if you're around, I'm sorry. I know it was terrible, but I did it in three weeks. So yeah, Idea has saved our backsides quite a few times, actually. Um, is it worth mentioning trigger lines briefly? So when you've um, worked with your actors, when just before they're going into the booth to record their lines, try and figure out a sentence or a phrase, a thing that says, that's this character. It's a catchphrase. It's something that you can all associate with a character as they, um, as they record. So uh, oh, I'm going to have to do it. This is going to sound really cheesy, but it works for the sci-fi radio show. There is this conspiracy theorist. And every time I had to do a line, I had to start off by going, this is Midnight Teddy, and you need to hear this. Over and over. <laughs> and it's seriously, unless he did the line, he would generally slip by the end of the sentence. I mean, obviously, that would be, he'd then do an entire take of a whole bunch of sentences, but if he tried to not do it, he would generally slip back to his normal speaking voice. So getting that, it's, it's again, it's like you were saying about the, uh, the Russian, it's getting into that rhythm, it's finding that rhythm and having a repeatable thing that you can do to find that rhythm and, and follow it. Also, when you're recording, it's, uh, if you're in the middle of a take and it's not working, just say, I need to stop, take a break, review. It's not a race against time with a lot of audio stuff because that's what uh, editing is for. <laughs> with apologies to my editors. Yeah, needed. Um, are there any voice actors in the, in the, in the house? Hans? Anyone? Yeah, yeah couple. we've got a couple. Couple, okay. A um, few things to do before, before doing some voice acting. Leo's quick tips. Oh, yes, okay. So, warming up. Um, it's it's got to be a full body affair. Do some press-ups, do some uh, vowels. Uh, stay hydrated, but not too hydrated. Well, that's point number three. Um, <laughs> On warming up, there's actually a fantastic TED talk about warming up. Um, I forget what it's called offhand. Do you remember, Leo? Um, if you look for warming up for public speaking, you'll find it, I'm sure. But there is a, a brilliant TED talk about warming up. Um, Leo does that. Uh, we found it's, it's really, really good. It's basically making a... Oh, the other thing about warming up is you're going to make a fool of yourself. You're going to spend a couple moments going... Ay, oh, ah, ooh, and all the time, but you need to relax, otherwise you're not gonna, um, 
you're not going to get the best uh, takes. And that's on camera now. Hello, internet. Um. So then there is the thing about eating an apple. This is a quick tip for um, mouth clicks are very common, and you'll find them out once you listen to raw stuff. And editors will kill you for having mouth clicks like I just had just there. It, it's, uh, it will happen. Um, I, I think to, uh, if, you're, if you've got loads of those, Isotope RX is an app that we can't afford at the moment, but it's a very good plugin uh, for mouth click, D-clicker, I believe is what it's called. But if you eat an apple, it tightens up the vocal cords, it's acid, it's nice and clean. It cleans your teeth too while you're at it. Apple day and all that. So the way in which we tend to record is to try and make the audio we capture as clean as possible to make the lives of the editors as easy as possible. Now, that's because we have more time from the voice actors more easily than we have time with the editors. And having edited out all of his mouth clicks from our audio drama, I can tell you that's not much fun. I don't recommend it. Um, so yeah, I would always recommend you capture as clean audio as you possibly can. And when it comes to clean audio, that's not about the quality or the expense of your microphone, that's about the space. So if you can find a room and cover it in pillows and blankets, that's much better than spending a thousand pounds on a microphone. We could record an audio drama right now with this microphone. It doesn't matter about the actual gear as long as it picks up sound. Focus on making your space uh, balanced. I can't think of the right word. <laughs> So there are a number of cheap microphones that are pretty good. Um, we found the Yeti, the Blue Yeti, to be really quite good. Um, I know in some voice acting circles it's dunked on, but it's a really good place to start. Especially if you're starting out. So we, are, we, we spoke to a few of you before this started, and a lot of you are getting started with something. And I think the best piece of advice we can give you is don't go and spend 800 quid on a microphone. Um, it's... You, there are so many other things you could spend that money on that will make you have more benefit in your overall product. Everybody gets started somewhere, so just start running with your idea and putting it to tape, well, digital. <laughs> well, that's the place to start, certainly. Um, studios are expensive, obviously they're better, but again, talking about slumming it a little, I guess, um, we have been able to pad a room very effectively. Now, the smaller the room, the easier that is. Um, we hang duvets or blankets um, across areas of the, of the room in order to absorb the sound. You can actually make a pretty dead area if you do that fairly extensively. And moving blankets are one of the best things in the universe because they are cheap and you absorb can, sound really well. You can also layer them up. So what we've, what we've done before is we've got those clothes hooks with the glue, the plastic slotting hooks, put them in the ceiling, build a box, uh, literally by hooking moving blankets around your recording space. So yeah, think about the sound, think about what's absorbing the sound, and think about whether it's reflecting. Again, that's going to do you more good than actually getting a better microphone. Uh, in terms of what you actually produce, in terms of quality. Um, recording programs, Leo. Okay. There are lots of free recording programs. I'm going to be controversial again. Audacity is a good recording program. It doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles, but you can get your tracks laid down. Um, there's been a scare about spyware. So if you can find, a, there's two things. If you can find a version of Audacity from before 3.3, download that. There's also a seed called Dark Audacity, which has a dark mode and is based off of a pre 3.3 build. If you're looking, or if you have an editor that knows their way around some software, um, Reaper is another free one that's a bit more complex. And then there's the two big boys. There's Logic, which is a Mac exclusive. Um, uh, whatever that word is, DAW. Program. Yeah, program, workstation. And then there's Pro Tools. They are both extremely good. However, I am a gorilla, so I don't like using them. And they're also quite expensive. And they're quite right. expensive, No yes. lies there. So yeah, um, it depends exactly what you're doing. 
in terms of recording, I've not yet met anyone who said Audacity to record wasn't absolutely fine. As long as you export in a WAV format, you know, and as high res it'll do it, you, you're going to have a good source file. So don't feel like you can't do that, especially if you have an editor who's external to what you're doing when you're recording it and can't be around, so you're just recording. You may as well grab the free program that is hit the record button and it goes. Yeah, I, not, nothing else to add to that. That's right. Um, understanding the limitations of your setup is quite an important factor in all this. So during COVID, we realized that we weren't going to be able to record in the way we normally like to, which is to have all of the voice actors hear the other voice actors' performances. It's not practical to do that over Skype. It's not practical to do that with eight people all having their own microphones. So what we did is we actually wrote a different style of audio drama and put a number of our other projects on hold in order to wait for COVID to end and everyone be able to be in the same room again. So consider, all the way back to when you're writing, consider, am I writing a thing that I can practically record? It's much better to keep it simple and do something with two or three people as a first attempt than it is to try and do something really, really ambitious with 20 different voice actors who all need to be in the same room and all recording at the same time because practically speaking, logistically speaking, you're really going to struggle with that if you don't know some of the basics that you're going to learn by doing it the first time. A little uh, fan dubbing tip that I learned back in the day for some remote recording. If you do have a couple of actors that are recording remotely, either get them to record a bunch of takes or have them in on Skype and have the person opposite that dialogue listen to that take so that they can get some ideas for reactions. Obviously, the way we record, we like having the organic nature of having all our cast there, but that's, uh, it's not perfect, but it's a nice addition if you do want to try and get some reactions from your uh, cast members. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely say that if you want to do fully remote recording, you need to be really careful about that. There's a lot of talent everywhere, all over the world, and it's a shame to deny it. But you do need to make sure that everything doesn't come out as a little bit stilted and not really reacting to the other person very well because of the fact they were recorded separately. Um, finally, the final tip about when recording um, is just about making sure there's someone other than you recording, listening to you while you are recording. Um, the reason being that even with uh, uh, you know, playback as you record, you're not going to really hear the things that are going on. Uh, there was a bane of my life during the audiobook recording where the ceiling would settle itself and click. And was, if it wasn't for Ed being in the room watching the levels, I would, I would miss it because I was deep in reading well, yeah, I mean, you're speaking, so you aren't hearing the tiny little click that the microphone is picking up in the background and sounds terrible. Human ears tune sound out naturally. Microphones hear everything, every little thing. The amount of times I've tried to cough or belly rumble in the other side of the room, and it just has ruined a thing. So... Uh, we are now going to move on to talking about directing, which is sort of my area. Um, so I have a few tips for directors out there. Any directors? Anyone want to hand? Yeah, cool, awesome, great. Okay, there are some. Wow, people want to listen to me. That's great. Um, you have a script. Uh, you know what it is that you want. You know what you want to have delivered. You know what you want to hear. I recommend putting the script down and listening to the voice actor. And because you can get very distracted by matching to the script, you see. And that's not always a good thing because sometimes the voice actor does something really good. It comes back to that Im non-immutable script that I spoke about. Does it sound good? Does it sound like the character? Does it sound like it's going to push the story forward in the direction you need it? Can you be flexible? Think carefully about that before you go, no, nope, no, nope, do it again, do it exactly what it says. Um, kind of comes down to that for ad-libs as well, or, or rewrites during recording that we were talking about earlier. Does it sound good? You know, does the actor think it sounds good? 
does the actor think it sounds in character? It's a second opinion, and it's the only person who's going to be as close to the character as you are as the director. Maybe, maybe the voice, you know, consider whether the voice actor feels like the character would say something in a different way. Be adaptable, be ready. And that brings me on to the voice actors, they're there because they want to be creative, just like you do. So make sure that they have a chance to be creative, they have the freedom to be creative. Yes, there are going to be lines, and as Leo said earlier, it's never, the lines are never going to be as loose as the voice actors would like them to be. Sorry, you know, we have a vision, we'd like to deliver that vision. But bear in mind that you do want to be somewhat mutable because if you are fixed and rigid, you will miss things, you will lose out, and it will be less good because the old adage is true, two heads are better than one. They're thinking about this character, they're, they're thinking about how they approach the world, they're trying to get into the mindset. So yeah, bear that in mind, consider that. It's important that actors, I've got written here, as a director, it's important that actors have freedom within reason. And then the next bullet point says, within reason is the most important part of that sentence. Um, which I'm sure is where Leo was talking about, uh, yep. not as flexible as you might like it to be as a voice actor. Um, the other thing to do to remember uh, that I found a very useful technique is to read the line yourself. You know, okay, here's the intonation I expect. Maybe I can't do the accent and Believe me, I can't. But at least I can give you the emphasis or the intonation that I want in a certain location. Especially if the voice actor's struggling to get what you're trying to say. On top of that, even if you don't, uh, sorry, voice actor interruption, if you don't understand a line, say, how do you want this read? That's a totally valid point to make. Now the final point about directing that I wanted to make was there is a value in staying silent to finish a take. Because if Leo says the line completely wrong, and I think it's completely wrong, and then continues on and finishes the sentence or the paragraph or whatever makes sense, it may be the second half of that paragraph is absolutely the best take that you do all day. Should you have spoken and interrupted him after that first sentence or just had him redo the first sentence? Think carefully about that before you get to gung-ho with interrupting all the time. Um, I certainly have a tendency towards interrupting too much and I like to be mindful of this when we're doing recordings. Um, finally, we've got a few very short points on editing and then we're going to try and fit in some Q&A because we are insanely short of time. Uh, we've got just uh, 13 minutes left. So, editing. Editing is, um, possibly after directing, editing is probably the hardest thing you can do for a, for a project. In I'd my say editing's harder. Oh, okay, well there we go. It's unanimous, editing is the hardest thing. Um, as a rule of thumb, it's gonna take three times as long as recording. So if you're a, you know, if you're a wannabe editor out there, bear that in mind, you know, if, if it's an hour long thing, and it took four hours to record, it will probably take you 12 hours to edit it. That being said, um, recording etiquette will help make things smoother. Um, I like an average of three takes. You always have three takes in one, two, three. You don't do the first uh, half a sentence and then the next half a sentence and then the first half a sentence. You do it in rules of threes because you don't want people cutting things up if they don't have to. Try and get a first draft done, send that to your directing team, and then um, they might say, oh, in the recording session, they, they did a really good bit at the start. Can we take that and put it at the front? You know, the, you can work, the drafting process will be easier if you work a little bit more organized during the recording session. So there are, both the director and the recording technician can, can make a serious difference to this. Um, the director can make sure that, as I said, takes are reasonably linear. The other thing that I like to do as the director is I have a copy of the script and I write down, oh, the second take was the best of this line. I don't agree with Leo that you must have three takes of everything. No, of course not. If you really, really like the first take, yeah, run with the first take. Don't bother re-recording it unless that you feel like there's a reason to. Again that is part of reducing the overall amount of recorded 
time, which reduces the amount of editing work. If you know you're just doing a take for no reason, yeah, that feels a bit pointless to me. The recording technician can do some organization, and it's worth using the breaks that the voice actors have to rearrange things, maybe remove takes that you know are dud, uh, or at least sections of takes that you know are dud, you know, put things together in a way that can allow you to, when you're an editor, pick that up more easily and actually move forward. Save, save separate scenes or episodes as raw files if, the, if you're doing a large scale uh, multi-record. <coughs> Sorry, multi-record. All of that said, at the end of the day, good editors are like gold dust. If you are a director, if you are a writer, if you're a voice actor, um, treasure them, value them, pay them as much as you can. It's worth it. I guess that's where some of that 800 quid that you didn't spend on the microphone can go, huh? Exactly. Okay, a really, 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 really brief talk about soundscaping. Because soundscaping, one, is very fun. Two, it helps you set the scene. Three, the best thing about sound is it's flexible. You can use something to make a sound and then manipulate that to make the audience think it's something else. Examples, I once used fried chicken to make a boiling uh, vat of molten lead. Uh, I once used a plastic bag um, to set fire to a small, what was it, tree, scarecrow, something like that. Um, I don't recall. And uh, three, we had a superhero that was running really fast. Like, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. we swung some lanyards around, and then uh, that was the whirlwind. So yeah, I mean, there is that. But we were, we also want to talk about how soundscaping can help set the scene. You want to think carefully about how much you use. You know, more too much wind is a bit like too much lens flare, right? It's just kind of noise that gets in the way and you aren't really experiencing what you want to. Too many droning sounds layered together will tune out. And if you la uh, let them last for longer than 10 seconds at maximum, everyone will leave it behind. It doesn't matter if you think you made an industrial shipyard in the year 2045. Um, buzz saws sound like buzz saws, no matter how many different types you put on. Uh, yeah, a little bit of uh, personal experience. That, that from wasn't personal that. experience at all, no. So the, the final thing that we're going to say, and then we're going to let you have a, as many minutes as we can get away with for Q&A, is um, alpha listeners. So you've gone through, you're the director, you've heard the final cut, you're happy. Show it to someone, like make someone else listen to it. It doesn't have to be someone who's necessarily harsh or kind, you know, somewhere in the middle is actually best. But look at their feedback, think about their feedback, think about whether you want to act on their feedback because just because that person doesn't like it doesn't mean that it's practical to act on it or indeed that it's necessarily a good thing to do. So think carefully about that, but get feedback as much as you can before the thing goes out into the world or you almost certainly will regret that. Any questions? Hands up, I'll And apologies for the whirlwind pace of this. We've been it, quite quick. It was a bit crazy, I know. Um, hi, I have a question. Um, do you think uh, an audio drama needs a script supervisor, or do you think that can just be completed by the director? I didn't hear that super well, I'm sorry. So the question was, do you think an audio drama needs a script supervisor, or can that be done by the director? I think that a script supervisor is a good idea, but it's not as um, continuity-laden as a, a film would be. It's about keeping track of takes, or maybe reminding the director, oh yeah, you really liked take number three. You know, um, it's important, but it's not vital, vital. We've had people wear that as a secondary hat in our cast. So if that's what you mean by script supervisor, because, you know, I was, I was on the fence there, um, I think my answer is, uh, we hand that to the assistant director. Leo's done that a bunch of times. Um, so I'll put down the script and go, okay, I'm listening. Does it work? Does it sound right? Um, and, and Leo will go, okay, we took three takes of this, we took seven takes of this, here are the words that were different, you know, that sort of thing. So it doesn't hurt. Thank you for the question. Hi. Um, what's uh, your go, work? Just go right into it, Hi. trust me. Uh, what's your uh, like, workflow and like, uh, 
like the speed of which you uh, have like turnover uh, episodes. Like, um, what do you think you should aim for when you're like starting out? So that's a really difficult question. That's kind of like saying, how long is a piece of string? Um, the question was about what, what should we aim for for workflow and turnover? Yeah, I heard that one. Um, I think it's complicated. Um, I think that for me starting out, I would not, if I was doing a podcast or some such, which I expected to go regularly, I would not even release the first episode until I had the first season done. That's because I'm a bit paranoid. I've been let down by a few editors. You know, things have fallen apart on projects. I would want to make sure that I have a good chunk done. Now, if, for example, you are the director and the editor, for example, so it's within your control, I don't think it's the end of the world if a podcast episode is a month late. You know, if that happens, it happens. If you have the expertise to do those final steps yourself, I would say probably get five or six episodes ahead and then proceed from there if you think that your time scale is the same as the time scale that an episode would take. But again, as a rule of thumb, I've given you a, a kind of a three times as long as the recording took. It depends, again, how long your episode is. I hope that helps. Hiya. Um, when it comes to uh, like using sound effects, I guess, do you recommend like creating your own, as, your own, as you said, with the lanyard? Or are there like resources or websites that you know of where you can source those sound effects without getting into problems? That's very much a Leo question. Okay, so yes, creating things is very fun, but here's what you can also do. You can steal them from website stores. Sounddogs.com has a load of, uh, I'm joking about the stealing. It's yeah, a free when he library. says steal, he means get them free. Get, yeah. get them free. Um, Sounddogs.com has a free public domain library. Um, if you Google public domain sound effects, you can find some stuff. Or if you're feeling particularly snazzy, there's a whole bunch of people on YouTube um, uploading sound effects that you can, you can rip. Uh, the other place, I've forgotten one. Oh, okay, this isn't sound effects, but royalty-free music, ccmixter.com, C-C-M-I-X-T-E-R, is a really nice place for remixes. And if you click the royalty-free button, there's a bunch of royalty-free stuff. And archive.org has a bunch of different things that you can, you can take, too. Um, any additions? There was one down there earlier. Are you still? Uh, at the moment, I use Audacity to edit all the sound stuff out of the videos. And then passing it, I also do video editing on top of it. So I was going to ask, when in regards to when I, produce, when I edit like, normal sound stuff, often there's Right, as I said, there is clicking as you get that. Like, I often mute if there's clicking in the middle of the, not middle of the sentence, but in like the pause. But that often sounds wrong and often end up cutting that out, which means to very fast sentences. Should I ultimately just leave the spaces as the gaps silenced, or should I just do cutouts? So there's a good trick for that, and I'm sure Ed will pick me up on this, but um, if you can take a, a split second of silence from the second break or a breath from the speaker, you can use that to remix the dialogue so if they're saying, and then I did an edit and it was clicked like this, <sighs> if you can cut the, <sighs> that'll get rid of any clicks and um, disjoints from any bits you're trying to remove on Audacity itself. Zoom in, get really yeah, granular get with really, it. Yeah, really, really far zoomed in. Um, and sometimes, I hate to say this because I am a perfectionist, but sometimes you can't remove the click. Uh, you just can't without ruining everything. So sometimes you just have to take a step back and go, you know what, I've tried. I've given this a good five, 10 minutes trying to remove this one click. It's not happening. I'm just gonna have to accept a click. And I think most of your audience won't slay you over a single click once every so often. Sometimes that's what background music and soundscaping is oh, for. Oh yeah, uh, I, there is no limit to what music covers in terms of sins. I'm not kidding, music is absolutely brilliant. Soundscaping is absolutely brilliant. It just washes over all of those horrible, horrible things that you can't fix. Hi. Um, what would you consider the best way to promote your show? Okay, so I will put my hand up. I am not the best at promotion, but my best example of promotion was on Twitter. So for all the audio drama people out there, this is the hashtag you want to follow. 
Audio Drama Sunday. Follow that, post things, follow other people in that tag, start kind of following like-minded, uh, if you, uh, I got friendly with some sci-fi and cyberpunk audio folks, and that's how I got stuff going for our first crowdfunder. Um, try and make some friends that way. I'll be honest, in my experience, it's kind of helped, but it's, it's about getting the word out. It's the same as saying, hey, listen to my thing. Just <laughs> drop it in normal conversation. You know, um, Twitter hashtags are quite good. There's Audio Drama Sunday, and then there's quite a few Audio Drama Discords as well. I would just add to that, um, it's worth finding, there are a few podcasts out there who actually like to put forward audio dramas made by other people. Um, uh, the, unfortunately, the one I'm thinking of oh, right now... The Sonic Society. Yeah, but they've stopped. Oh, okay. So, unfortunately... The one I'm thinking about kind of, yeah, he's not putting it out at the moment, but um, there are a lot of people out there who will guest a podcast or uh, guest an episode of a podcast, I guess, um, or who will happily promote other people because everyone has the same problem, right? It, it, it is hard. It is the hardest thing about all of this. I disagree with Leo. It's not the editing. It's actually getting the word out because there's so much noise, pun intended. Um... There's so much noise out there. There are so many people because it's so easy and that's great because it means that a lot of people can create. It means there's a lot of people out there shouting for your attention. Do not get disheartened because if you like your idea, someone out there will also like your idea. It's then just a question of finding that person. I, of course, always have a serious question. So um, do you voice actors ever have special requests for types of Apple? Yeah, Granny Smiths are the best. Oh, yeah, no, Granny Smith oh, is the best apple. Yeah. Definitely. The greener and sourer are the better. Have we got time for one more question? One more question. Who wants to be the last person? Yeah. Who wants to be the last question? No one. No one? We've answered every question possible about every audio Every question dramas. possible. Wow, we we're... have succeeded. Well done, us. <laughs> 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 okay, double dipping. What do you want to say? Um, I don't know now. Oh, perfect. Oh, ha, okay, one more, one, one more. Would a pink lady apple work? No, it's a bit too sweet, actually. Like, in, in all seriousness, a sourer apple with less sugar content, because sugar causes phlegm, which causes mucus, which causes bad noise. Yes, like dairy. Yeah. However, if you do, if an actor comes in and says, oh, I'm sorry, I had a milkshake for breakfast, which has happened, unfortunately, get them to down either lemon tea and ginger or... A lot Lots of, of vinegar. Oh, vinegar, actually. Lots that's of true. vinegar. It's vinegar very funny. If you want to punish them, that's true. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, seriously, for the oh. voice actors, hydrate, okay? Yeah. But hydrate before you eat the green apple. Do not hydrate after because you will just go back to mouth clicking. Okay, I think this is the last, last question. Really, honestly, the last. Uh, do you think it would be a bad idea to have like. Uh, the editor and the writer to be the same person, or the director and the editor to be the same person, or the writer Not and the all. director to be the same person. Not at all. The reality is, in an indie production, you're going to wear multiple hats. Yeah, no. Um, uh, it, it's completely doable that one person does the lot, right? It, it's been done very successfully on some occasions that I'm aware of. It just so happens that... It's a lot of work. It's yeah. a lot of work. And I would always recommend that you get a second opinion. So whether that is you are the writer, editor director and the voice actor, but you get someone else in to, um, in, in to write with you, or someone else, and or I should say, someone else in to sit and listen or do the recording for you, at least hit the record button for you. It's worth it, because doing everything solo is extremely difficult, again, it, because of the reasons we've discussed before. It can be done, it just doesn't work for us. That's why we work as a duo. So go forth and do it, but just remember, have someone have someone there to back you up, to listen to something, to read over something. Just having a, someone you can sort of take a break for is a good idea, I'd say. But it's not wrong at all. It's, come on. It's fine. It's yeah. happened, yeah. Absolutely. There is no wrong way to do this. If there's one, while we've given you advice, if there's one thing I think we want to leave you with is that there is no wrong way to create an audio drama or a podcast or an audio book or anything else. Yeah, nothing Do what works for you. These are the things that works for us. Maybe they'll give you a shortcut. Maybe you'll go away and you'll look at it and you go, 
those guys were crazy. What on earth were they talking about? That doesn't work. I don't know. And you'd be fine with that. That's yeah, and that's fine. Like we, we're not going to be insulted. That's fine. Find what works for you. All right. Thank you for coming. If you've got any more questions, you can follow us to IG one no, one, one, one G eleven one G eleven, which is like just around the corner from the N three exit. If you're like me and you don't remember table numbers. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.